I'm now going to talk you through all that abstract philosophical stuff. I'm going to talk to you about the freeologies and why we need to get our heads around this stuff before we do our interviews. The next question is... You're full of questions. OK, yes, we are soaring to high planes of abstract thinking around big theoretical stuff. Now, don't fret, don't be frightened, you'll be OK, but we do need to do this stuff because it's a key way by which you'll understand the differences between big Q, qualitative and quantitative methods. That difference matters because the biggest problem psychology students have with big Q qualitative methods is not recognising how very different they are to quantitative methods and quantitative methodology. So, they think being objective is good, being systematic is good, and testing hypotheses is good, and indeed all of that is good when you're doing quantitative research, but all of that's really bad when you're doing big Q qualitative methods. So, the ologies, the three ologies, three of them, ontology, epistemology, and methodology. And remember to supplement this recording by looking at chapter two of our prescribed text by Braun and Clark. So, here we go. What we're talking about, really, is about knowledge systems. And a knowledge system contains those three parts, the ontology, epistemology, and methodology. But it can also contain something called cosmology, but don't worry about that. We're not going to go there in this unit. We're not going to go out, <laughs> go to outer space, Inten not intentionally, anyway. Let's go and define our three ologies, starting with ontology. Ontology is all about the relationship between the world out there and us. In a nutshell, it's the answer to the question, what is reality? And there are two big answers here. One is known as realism, and the other is known as relativism. So we'll look at those in a minute. Now, once you've decided your ontological position, you need to choose an epistemology. And in a nutshell, this is the answer to the question, what is knowledge? Epistemology is the theory of knowledge, and there are a number of different epistemological positions available to us, but we'll briefly look at two of these, the key ones for psychology, which are positivism and social constructionism. So there you go. Ontology is the theory of reality. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. Methodology, that's the system of acquiring knowledge. It's the answer to the question, how do we obtain knowledge? And we've got two main types here, qualitative and quantitative. Though as you hear me go on and on and on about, there are actually two types of qualitative. There's big Q and little Q. And we're doing big Q because big Q is better. Now, let's look at these ontological and epistemological positions in more detail to see if we can flesh it out a little bit more. Let's start with those two different ontologies, realism and relativism. Under realism, reality sits independent of us. It exists out there whether we know it or not, and the task of research is to observe that independent reality and understand it. And to do that, we must maintain an objective stance so that we get a true observation. We shouldn't allow our own bias to contaminate our observation. Now, under relativism, there is no independent reality. Reality only exists once we perceive it. It does not exist independently of us. It's relative to us. So the task of research is to capture this subjective reality, to understand how the observer makes sense of their observations. Now, your choice of ontology depends on the area of your inquiry. You shouldn't just choose one over the other because you like the sound of it. So let me explain. When a tree falls in the woods, and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, the answer is yes. It does make a sound. It makes a sound because when the tree falls, it causes a disturbance in the air pressure field in the woods. And that pressure field emanates away from the fallen tree. And that moving pressure field is what we call sound. The physics of this phenomena are quite well understood and very independent of anyone being there to hear the sound. That illustrates a realist ontological position. 
that is used to answer that question about falling trees and sound. But what if you asked a slightly different question? What if you asked, when a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a noise? Here the answer is no. Why? Well, because the common definition of noise is of an unwelcome or undesirable sound. So for the sound to be unwelcome, there must be a listener, a person there to hear it and to be annoyed by it. And the question of whether the tree makes a noise when it falls requires that a person be there to make a judgment as to whether the sound is undesirable. And this illustrates a relativist position. So different ontological positions are required for answering different types of questions. And that's a key point. And if you're asking questions that involve thinking about how people make sense of the world, rather than looking at inanimate objects and looking at how inanimate objects act in the world, then I think you'd be better with a relativist rather than a realist ontology. Now, once you've decided upon your ontological position, you then choose your epistemological position. But that choice is limited by your ontological position. So let's get to those epistemologies. Under realism, you need an epistemological position that holds knowledge comes in the form of an objective truth. And it's a singular truth because it doesn't matter who perceives it. There will only be one version of it. So there you go. And positivism is an example of such an epistemological position. Under relativism, you need an epistemological position that holds that knowledge comes in the form of multiple contextual truths that are dependent on the interpretation of the observer. So if you have many observers, you can have many different interpretations and thus many different truths. So truth is relative to the person who observes that truth. And social constructionism is an example of such an epistemological position. Now, positivism is the epistemology that informs most, if not all, of your training in quantitative methods. And that's why you might have a struggle shifting over to constructionism, social constructionism, which is what we're going to be using in this part of our unit. Uh, positivism holds that trustworthy knowledge is gained through direct ob objective observation of the world, ideally, un uh, ideally under tightly controlled experimental conditions where the object we're investigating is placed in a sterile laboratory and that using rational argument based on those observations can give us an objective understanding of the world. And it does that through us putting forward cause and effect relationships and testing to see which of those relationships can best explain our observations. So temperature interacts with water and results in water undergoing a changed state. Well, that's a bit of knowledge we've gained from that sort of approach. But positivism has been challenged as being too crude to capture the complexity of human experience. Our behaviours are not readily explained by simple cause-effect explanations, nor can we understand human experience by stripping away the social context in which it occurs and try to observe it in a sterile laboratory. Positivism doesn't seem to reflect the reality of the human condition, which is inherently social. And that's why some in psychology turn to social constructionism, particularly my bunch in critical psychology, but also big Q qualitative researchers. We all tend to, well, we all do shift away from positivism towards such things as social constructionism and epistemologies like that. Okay, that's where we come from. And, and for, for, for us, knowledge is socially constructed and knowledge is that shared way of thinking about and representing the world that groups of people develop in collaboration with each other. Now in our big sessions, our big sessions, <laughs> our big sessions, our sessions on big Q, they are big sessions. I like to think of them as that, not long. This one's, oh, I'll, I'll get on with it because otherwise this will be a big video, as in long. Um, in our sessions on big Q qualitative methods, you need to ground everything you do into a relativist ontology and a constructionist epistemology. That's the trick 
to doing well on the assessments. Now, we have one more ology to cover. Methodology is the theory or framework that guides how knowledge is acquired. It tells us how research should be done, how we should get a sample, how we should get data from that sample, how we should make sense of the data and so on. You can have many different methods that sit under a methodology. We're looking at just one type of method of data collection, uh, the online individual interview, and just one type of method of data analysis, which is experiential thematic analysis. The textbook covers a whole load of other methods, but we're just looking at those methods. Um, the, the methods you use, they are they're specific techniques that you use in research and they have to fit within your epistemology and your ontology. So let's wind this all up. This interview is over. Okay. Um, a quick summing up for you. So we've got two different methodologies, quantitative and big Q qualitative, that see the world and the people in it differently because they adopt different ontologies and epistemologies. They represent different views about the nature of reality and the nature of knowledge. And they form two different knowledge systems. And your job on this unit is to make sure you sit under the right knowledge system. Because if you sit in the wrong one, you'll engage with your interview participant in the wrong way. You'll ask them the wrong types of questions. You'll come up with the wrong types of analysis. In a word, you'll mess it up. You'll mess it up big time. So there you go. No pressure, but do try to get it right if you can and I'll help you along the way. Now, that's all for now. Well done for getting through this one. This one's been quite philosophical, quite deep. Um, read chapter two, that will help you out with our textbook. Uh, so till next time, ta-da. <laughs>